by mercy's hands A feather of beauty where you stand The doorway to another land Good evening, everyone. I hope you all can hear me all right. If someone would type a letter Y. Okay, very good. I see you can. Why, why don't you open our session tonight with some prayer, brother? Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight and open in prayer to speak directly with the author of the book tonight who will be studying. Thank you for the privilege and the honor we have tonight with being able to study your word. And as we really dig deep into what it has to say for us and how it applies and can't apply 
to our lives if we really do it and put it into practice. Thank you for Romans and his willingness to lead tonight. I see you. you would awesome and all the rest of us who are here tonight as we gather around to see what you would have to say tell us tonight and also as Romans presents another installment of the study he's been presenting to us so far on basic Christianity. In Christ's name, Amen. Amen, and thank you for that violinist. Well, as I look over our list of attendees, I see we are graced tonight to also have with our regulars, God is glorious, hopefully, and beloved, and I'm certainly, I certainly welcome all of you here. Can you all hear me as I speak? God is glorious has no sound. Okay, I don't know what to tell. Oh, you can now, God is glorious? Okay, very good. Welcome to all of you. I'm really, I really appreciate seeing such a full house. I'm going to say this tonight because I said it last week and I'll say it, God willing, next week. This is a discussion and not a lecture. Please feel free to contribute thoughts, ideas, comments, complimentary scriptures. But I will ask you again to hold all your questions till the end. I will gladly answer them then. But I have a lot of material. I like to get to all of it. So if you just bear with me in that, make a mental or physical note of your question, and I'll be happy to answer it at that time. Having said all that, let us begin. Shall we? Yes, there's a rabbit trail for you, because I'm a sucker for rabbit trails. I love them, and you got to keep me off them, so I need you to help me do that. <clears throat> We are continuing in our series, Basic Christianity. Tonight, we're continuing in the review and examination of our Christian walk as a facet of basic Christianity. We're going to continue our acrostic review of the phrase, by growing in grace, in regard to our following in the steps of Christ. We have covered this far the letters, I should read thus far, B Y B and Y in the letter in the word by and G R O N W. Now growing in for the letter I in in, I've been going through all of the I M statements Jesus made. Last week we continued on the first occasion of the letter I in the word growing. Uh, we're reviewing and examining I am. Jesus I am statements last week we reviewed and examined the I am declaration I am the resurrection and the life and for those of you who heard that either live or on the YouTube <clears throat> video I think you'll come to realize and agree that the commentators that I quoted gave some new depth meaning and, and insights to that statement, and it was quite wonderful and invigorating to me. Uh, Jesus continued, He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. So picking up where we left off last week, we completed that I am declaration, and we move on to Jesus' next I am declaration. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Before I get into the actual text, I'd just like to make this statement for you to consider. <clears throat> for all those who refuse, for whatever reason, to acknowledge Jesus being God in the flesh, I am not impressed, and I am not placated by their saying, well, he was a good teacher, though. 
He was a good teacher. A good teacher does not say, I am the way. A good teacher does not say, I am the truth. A good teacher does not say, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If your child came home from school and told you that their teacher, who you used to, thought was, used to think was very good, told them that I am, that they, that they said, I am the truth. Would you say, oh, this is wonderful. My child has a good teacher after all. So am I saying that Jesus was not a good teacher? I'm saying he was an incomprehensible, incomprehensibly great teacher. But that he was also God in the flesh and that only he could say, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And that no man comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> and beloved quotes Hebrews 1.3, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature, upholding all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high can you think of any other g good teachers that that could be said of he's the radiance of god's glory no there are none there are none let's start in our text tonight of these words alexander mclaren writes the way our lord has been speaking of his departure of its purpose of his return as guaranteed by that purpose and of his servants eternal and perfect reunion with him but even these cheering and calming thoughts do not exhaust his consolations as they did not satisfy all the disciples needs might still have said yes we believe that you will come back again we believe that we shall be together but what about the parentheses of absence here's the answer or at least part of it whither i go ye know and ye know and know the way and and the way ye know of or if we adopt the shortened form which the revised version gives us whither i go Ye know the way. <clears throat> when you say to a man, you know the way, you mean come. And in these words, there lies, it seems to me, a veiled invitation to the disciples to come to him before he came back for them. And the assurance that they, though separated, might still find and tread the road to the Father's house, and so be with him still. They are not left desolate. The Christ who is absent is present as the path to himself. And so the parenthesis is bridged across. Now in these verses we have several large and important lessons which I think may be best drawn by simply seeking to follow their course. <clears throat> Number one, observe the, the disciples' unconscious knowledge. Jesus Christ says, ye know the way, and ye know the goal. One of them ventures flatly to contradict him, to, and to traverse both assertions with a brusque and thoroughgoing negative. We do not know whither thou goest, says Thomas. How can we know the way? He is the same man in this conversation that we find 
find him in the interview before our Lord's journey to raise Lazarus, and in the interview after our Lord's resurrection. <clears throat> In all three cases, he appears as mainly under the dominion of sense, as slow to apprehend anything beyond its limits, as morbidly melancholy and disposed to take the blackest possible view of things, practical pessimist, and yet with a certain kind of fa frank outspokenness which half redeems the other characteristics from blame. He could not understand all the words, de all the Lord's deep words just spoken. His mind was befogged and dimmed, and he blurts out his ignorance, knowing that the best place to carry it is to the illuminator who can make it light. We know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Was Jesus right? Was Thomas right? Or were they both right? <clears throat> the fact is that Thomas and all his fellows knew after a fashion but they did not know that they knew they had heard much in the past as to where Christ was going plainly enough it had been rung in their ears over and over again it had made some kind of lodgment in their heads, and in that sense, they did know. It is this unused and unconscious knowledge of theirs to which Christ appeals, and which he tries to draw, in, draw out into their consciousness and power when he says, You know whither I am going, and you know the road. Is not that exactly what a patient teacher will do with some flustered child when he says, when he says to it, "Take time. You know it well enough if you'll only think." So the master says here, "Do not be agitated and troubled in heart. Reflect, remember, overhaul your stores, and think what I have told you over and over again." And you will find that you do know whither I'm going, and that you do know the way. He already told the disciples, beloved writes, that he was going to the Father's house to prepare a mansion or, or room for them. And that is true. That is one of the things that he said he was going to be doing. <clears throat> The patient gentleness of the master with the slowness of the scholars is beautifully exemplified here, as is also the method which he lovingly and patiently adopts of sending men back to consult their own consciousness as illuminated by his teaching, and to see whether there is not lying, lying somewhere, unwrecked of and unemployed in some dusty corner of their mind, a truth that only needs to be dragged out and cleaned in order to show itself for what it is. The all-sufficient light and strength for the moment's need. <clears throat> Dialogue is an instance of what is true about us all that we have in our possession truths given to us by Jesus Christ, the whole sweep and bearing of which, the whole majesty and power and illuminating capacity of which we do not yet dream of yet. How much in our creeds lies dim and undeveloped? Time and circumstances and some sore agony of spirit are needed in order to make us realize the riches that we possess, 
and the certitudes to which our troubled spirits may cling. <clears throat> The practice of far more patient, honest, profound meditation and reflection than finds favor with the average Christian man is needed, too, in order that the truths possessed may be possessed, and that we may know what we know and understand the things that are given to us of God. And I'm going to make the effort on those occasions when a phrase like the average Christian man is used, I may omit the word man or, or add women to that. Because not only in this room, but in the church, certainly <clears throat> women are a part of it. And this was written in the 1800s. But what Paul wrote about there's neither male nor female should have applied then, and I'm going to apply it now. So when you see me add or edit as I'm reading, that's what I'm doing and why. In all your creeds, there are large tracts that you, in some kind of fashion, do believe. And yet they have no vitality in your consciousness, nor power in your lives. And the Master here does with these disciples exactly what he is trying to do day by day with us, namely, fling us back on ourselves, or rather upon his revelation in us, and get us to fathom its depths, to walk around, walk around about its magnitudes, and so to understand the things that we say we believe. All our knowledge is ignorance. Ignorance that confesses itself to him is in the way of becoming knowledge. His light will touch the smoke and change it into red spires of flame. If you do not know, go to him and say, Lord, I do not. An accurate understanding of where the darkness lies is the first step to the light. We are meant to carry all our inadequate and superficial realizations of his truth into his presence that from him we may gain deeper knowledge, firmer faith, and a more joyous certitude in his inexhaustible lessons. In every article and item of the Christian faith, there is a transcendent element which surpasses our present comprehension. Let us be confident that the light will break, and let us welcome the new illumination when it comes, sure that it comes from God. <clears throat> be not puffed up with the conceit that you know all. Be sure of this. According to the good old metaphor, we are but as children on the shore of the great ocean, gathering a few of the shells that it has, that it has washed to our feet, itself stretching boundless and, thank God, sunlit before us. Ye know the way. Master, ye know not the way. Number two, observe here in the second place our Lord's great self-revelation, which meets this unconscious knowledge. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now it's quite plain, I think, from the whole strain of the context and the purpose of these words, 
But the main idea in them is the first, I am the way. <clears throat> That is made more certain because of the last words of the phrase, which, summing up the force of the three preceding assertions, dwell only upon the metaphor of the way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let me just stop here briefly to say, to add to what he's saying. When Jesus said, I am the way, and no man cometh to the Father but by me, the word for the way is not what we would consider the manner. The word way there means an actual road. In other places in the New Testament, when the word way is used, it is speaking of a literal, physical road. And so this could well have been translated, I am the road. I am the path to the Father. So let's keep that in mind when we realize what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, I am the manner, or I'm the version, or I am the uh, method. No, he's speaking about a literal path, a literal road. So let's continue. So that of these three great words, the way, the truth, and life, we are to regard the second and the third as explanatory of the first. Not coordinate, but the first is more is the more general, and the other two show how the first comes to be true. I am the way because I am the truth and the life. There are no words of the Master, perhaps, to which my previous remarks are more necessary to be applied than these. We know, and yet, oh, what an overplus of glory and of the depth is here. We do not know, and can never know, the most fragmentary and inadequate grasp of them, with heart and mind, will bring light to the mind and quietness and peace to the heart. The whole meaning of them goes beyond men and angels. We can only skim the surface and seek to shift back the boundaries of our knowledge a little further, and to embrace within its limits a little more of the, of the broad land into which the words bring us. So just take a thought or two, which may tend in that direction. Note, note then, as belonging to all three of these clauses, that remarkable I am. We show away. Christ is it. We speak truth. Christ is it. The violinist writes, too many churches that at one time had preaching like this are now abandoned or their hearts have grown, co grown cold. Well, violinist, that is a tragically true statement in England, which has, uh, last I heard, dropped to a 5 or 6% church attendance rate. There are great old cathedrals and, and magnificent structures are sold off as warehouses, or in one case that I'm familiar with, recording studios, because the acoustics were so wonderful. And that is a true tragedy. Beloved writes, I am the gate. If anyone enters through me, he'll be saved. He will come in and, he will come in and go out and find pasture. <coughs> Very good. That's a great point, beloved. He also said, that he was the gate or the door of the sheep. Parents impart life, which they have received, which they have received, and Christ is life. 
He separates himself from all men that, rep that by representation that he is not merely the communicator or the teacher or the guide, but that he himself is in his own personal being, way, truth, life. He said that. Calvary was in arm's length. What did he think about himself? And what should we think of him? And beloved writes, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. There are so many things and so many facets of, of his person, of his being, of his existence. He could spend the rest of eternity pondering who and what Jesus was and all that he is. <clears throat> and then note further that he sets forth his unique relation to the truth as being one ground on which he is the way to God. He is the truth in reference to the divine nature. And that truth, then, is not mere, a mere matter of words. It's not only speech that teaches us, but himself that shows us God. His whole life and character, his personality, are the true representation within human conditions of the invisible God. <clears throat> Welcome, web user one. And when he says, I am the way and the truth, he is saying substantially the same thing as the great prologue of this gospel says when it calls him the word and the light of men, as hopefully just uh, quoted for us. And as Paul says when he names him the image of the invisible God, there's all the difference between talking about God and showing him. Men reveal God by their words. Christ reveals him by himself. And the facts of his life, the truest and highest representation of the divine nature that men can ever have, is in the face of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I need only remind you in a sentence about other and lower applications of this great saying, which do not, as I think, enter into the purpose of the context. He is the truth inasmuch as in the life and historical manifestation of Jesus Christ, as recorded in the scriptures, men find foundation truths of a moral and spiritual sort. Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatsoever things are lovely and of good report, he is these. And all true ethics is but the formulating into principles of all the facts of the life and character of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Further, my text says that he is the way because he is the life. On the one side, God is brought to all, all hearts. And in some real sense to our comprehension, I the life of Jesus Christ, and so he is the way. But that's not enough. There must be an action upon us all as an action having reference to the divine nature. God is brought to men by the manifestation of Christ. And we, the dead, are quickened by the communication of the life. The one phrase points to all his works as a revealer. The other points to all his works upon us as life-giving, as a life-giving spirit, a quickener, and an inspirer. <clears throat> Dead men 
cannot walk a road. It's of no use to make a path if it starts from a cemetery. Christ taught that men, apart from him, are dead. And that, only li and that the only life that they can have, by which they can be knit to God, is the divine life which was in himself, and of which he is the source, and the principle for the whole world. He does not tell us here what is yet what yet is true, and what he abundantly tells in other parts of this great conversation, the only way by which the life which he can bring can be diffused and communicated is by his death. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. He is the life and paradox of mystery and yet fact, which is the very heart and center of his gospel. His only way of giving his life to us is by giving up his physical life for us. He must die that he may be the life spring for the world. The alabaster box must be broken if the ointment and its fragrance are to be poured out. And death is the gate of life, in a deeper than the ordinary sense of the saying, inasmuch as the death of the life which is in Christ is the life of the death which we are. Well, wow, that's a heavy statement. Think of that. <clears throat> the death of the life which is Christ is the life of the death which we are. So, because on the one hand, he brings a God to our hearts that we can love and trust. And because, on the other hand, he communicates to our spirits, dead in the only true death, which is the separation from God by sin, the life by which we are knit to God. He is the way to the Father. What about people that never heard of him? To whom that way has been closed? To whom that truth has never been manifested. To whom that life has never been brought. Ah, Christ has other ways of working then through his historical manifestation. For there is no truth more plainly taught in this great fourth gospel than this. But that light lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The eternal word works through all the earth in ways beyond our ken. And wherever any man or woman has, however imperfectly, felt after and grasped the thought of a father in the heavens. There the word, which is the light of men, has wrought. And beloved writes from Romans 2.14, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts either accusing or defending them. <clears throat> and that is, beloved, the exact reference that I was thinking of as well when I first read those words. But for us to whom this book has come, 
But what people call in bitter irony Christendom, the law of my text rigidly applies, and it is being worked out all round us today. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And here we are in this England of ours, and in our sister nations on the continent of Europe, and in America, face to face, as I believe, with this, alt with this alternative. Either Jesus Christ, the revealer of God, and the life of men, or an empty heaven. <clears throat> And for you individually, it is either take Christ for the way or wander into the wilderness and forget your Father. It's either take Christ for the truth or be given over to the insufficiencies of mere natural, political, and intellectual truths. The shows and illusions of time and sense. It's either take Christ for your life or remain in your deadness separate from God. He quite powerfully shows either or is in those three statements that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lastly, we have here the disciples' ignorance and the new vision which dispels it. In the next verse, Jesus says, If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Our Lord accepts for the moment Thomas' standpoint. He supplements his former allegation of the disciples' knowledge with the admission of the ignorance which went with it at its, as its shadow. It was only too sadly and plainly shown by their failure to discern in him the manifestation of the Father. just told them that they did not know what they thought they knew not. And now he tells them that they did not know what they thought they knew so well after so many years of companionship, even himself. The proof that they did not is that they did not know the Father as revealed in him, nor him as revealing the Father. If they missed out, he missed everything. For all they had known of his graciousness were strangers to his truest self. Their ignorance would turn out knowledge if they would think, and their supposed knowledge would turn out ignorance. <clears throat> Lesson for us is that the truest test of the completeness and worth of our knowledge of Christ lies in its being knowledge of God the Father being brought near to us by Him. This saying puts a finger on the radical deficiency of all merely humanitarian views of Christ's person. However clearly they may see and admiringly extol the beauty of his character and the sweet reasonableness of his wisdom. They all break down here and are arraigned as so shallow and incomplete. They do not deserve to be called knowledge of him at all. Do you know anything about Jesus Christ rightly? That is what you know about him, that in him you see God. If you have not seen God in him, you have not got the heart 
you've not got to the heart of the mystery. The knowledge of Christ which stops with the man and the martyr and the teacher and the beautiful, gentle brother is knowledge so partial that he cannot even venture to call it other than ignorance. Oh, brethren, do our conceptions of him meet this test which he himself has laid down? And can we say that seeing him we see in him God. <clears throat> and then our Lord passes on, another, on to another thought. A new vision which at the moment was being granted to this unconscious ignorance that was passing into conscious knowledge. From henceforth ye know him and have seen him. We must give that from henceforth as a note of time a somewhat liberal interpretation and apply it to the whole series of utterances and deeds of which the words of our text are but a portion. And if so, we come to this was in the wisdom and the gentleness and the deep truths of that upper chamber. It was in the agony and submission of Gethsemane. It was in the meek patience before the judges, in the silent acceptance of ignominy and shame. It was in the willing, loving endurance of the long hours upon the cross that Christ inaugurated the new stage in his revelation of God and in his life-giving to the world. <clears throat> it is from henceforth and thereby that in the man Jesus we know and see the Father as they never did before. The cross and the passion of Christ are the unveiling to the world of the heart of God. And by the side of that new vision, the fairest and the loftiest and the sweetest of Christ's former manifestations and utterances sink into comparative insignificance. It is the dying Christ that reveals the living God. So, dear friends, He is your way to God. See that you seek the Father by Him alone. He is your truth. Grapple Him to your hearts. And by patient meditation and continual faithfulness, enrich yourselves. With all the communicated treasures that you have already received in him. He is your life. Cleave to him that the quick spirit that was in him may pass into you and make you victors over all deaths, temporal and eternal. <clears throat> Know him as a friend, not as a mere historical person or with mere head knowledge. For to know a friend is something far deeper than to know a truth. Acquaint thyself with him and be at peace. This is eternal life, to know with the knowledge which is life and possession, thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And that's the end of Alexander McLaren's insights on that phrase. I hope you can see from his offering tonight why I love this man's writing and his insights. They are almost unmatched. They are incredible. <clears throat> and Beloved writes from Romans 8.11, 
and the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. <coughs> Thank you for that. Beloved, that was perfectly applied. Well, to this, John Gill adds, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. The Lord takes the opportunity of this discourse about the place he was going to and the way unto it more fully to instruct his disciples concerning himself, saying, I am the way. Christ is not merely the way as he goes before pe as he goes before his people as an example or merely as a prophet, pointing out unto them by his doctrine the way of salvation. But he is the way of salvation itself by his obedience and sacrifice. <clears throat> or is there any other? He is the way of his Father's appointing, which is entirely agreeable to the perfections of God and suitable to the case and condition of sinners. He is the way to all the blessings of the covenant of grace. And he is the right way into a gospel church state here. No one comes rightly into a church of Christ but by faith in him. And he is the way to heaven. He has entered into it himself by his own blood and has opened the way to it through himself for his people. He adds, not only I am the way, I am the truth. The truth he is not only true, but the truth he is not only true, but truth itself. This may regard his person and character. He is the true God and eternal life. Truly and really man, as a prophet, he taught the way of God and truth. As a priest, he is faithful as well as merciful, as a merciful one. True and faithful to him that appointed him. And as a king, just and true are all his ways and administrations. He is the sum of and substance of all of the truths of the gospel. <clears throat> they are all full of him and center in him. And he is the truth of all types and shadows, promises and promises, are the promises and prophecies of the Old Testament. They have all their accomplishment in him. And he is the true way in opposition to all the false ones of man's devising. And this phrase seems to be opposed to a notion of the Jews that the law was the true way of life. And who can find truth to the law? They have a saying that Moses and his law are the truth. <clears throat> make this Korah and his company say in hell that the law of Moses was truth is certain but it is too strong an expression to say of Moses himself that he was the truth but well agrees with Christ by whom grace and truth came in opposition to Moses by whom came the law but when they say there is no truth but the law, they do not speak truth. More truly they do, do they speak when, in answer to that question, what is truth, it is said that he is the living God and king of the world, characters that well agree with Christ. Besides the way and the truth, Jesus also said that he was the life. Christ is the author and giver of life, natural, spiritual, and eternal. Or he is the way of life, the living way, 
In opposition to the law, which was so far from being the way of life, that it was the ministration of condemnation and death. He always and ever will be the way. All in this way we all in this way live. None ever die. And it is a way that leads to eternal life. And to conclude all the epithets in one sentence, Christ is the true way to eternal life. It is added by way of explanation of him as the way. <clears throat> Jesus followed it all up by saying, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ is the only way of access unto the Father. There is no coming to God as an absolute God, not upon the foot of the covenant of works, nor without a mediator. The only mediator between God and man is Christ. He introduces and presents the persons and services of his people to his Father and gives them acceptance with him. <clears throat> Finally tonight we have an offering from the Sermon Bible. Christ the Truth truth of Christ was an attribute above all others essential to the offices which he undertook to fulfill. I shall take five of these offices. Number one, that of a witness. What is a witness without truth? Number two, the substance of that which is the whole of the Old Testament was the shadow. But the substance of anything is the truth of anything. Therefore, Christ is truth. <clears throat> Number three, the founder of a faith very different from all others which ever appeared upon this earth. Its precepts are the strictest. Its doctrines are the loftiest. Its consolations are the strongest. Now, what intense veracity did that require in him? And number four, Christ in his people's truth, his people's righteousness. And what must be the truth of him who was to be the truth of the whole world? And number five, Christ is judge. How unspeakably momentous it is. And the last great division of all human destiny. The judge should be true. The violinist asks, why has church attendance dropped in the UK? And also, why has spiritual fire gone out in the hearts of people for the most part? <coughs> they're, just, they're just walking, they're just going through the motions, violinist. They know the words and they're talking the talk. And, but nowadays they're not even talking the talk. Much less, much less walking the talk. Beloved writes, narrow is the gate and few enter in. You know, and the more you realize these things, the more it makes sense that Jesus said, Jesus asked the question that when he returns, shall he find faith? <clears throat> Shall he find faith? I mean, it is waning. It is truly waning. Number two, there are three empires of truth. <clears throat> the intellectual, moral, and the spiritual. Number one, I doubt whether any mind ever attains the highest order of intellect without an acquaintance with Jesus Christ. For if everything took its rise in the mind of Christ, then the true science of every subject must revert to Christ. Number two, Christ is the Son, the center of moral truth. 
its proportion as nations have departed from Christ, they have wandered out of the orbit of truth. Testing, one, two, three, four. Did you all hear any of that last paragraph? Let me read that last paragraph again. For the sake of getting this right. <clears throat> Every man as he dwells more in Christ grows in rectitude of conduct and integrity of practice. Number three, Christ is that Amen in the revelation which clenches and ratifies to men the whole scroll of love. <clears throat> and every glimpse of joy, every flood of sorrow in a believer's heart coming and working its appointed purpose there just according to the chart which God laid down from all eternity, gives another and another evidence of the fact that Christ is truth. And that was a sermon delivered by, <clears throat> or written, by J. Vaughn in a book called Sermons from 1868. And for those of you who thought I was just about to say it, and you would be correct, this concludes this evening's discussion. Basic Christianity, Part 42. I greatly appreciate all of your attendance here tonight. I hope I opened your eyes to some new ways of understanding and appreciating and applying Jesus' words that he is the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> I know it has for me. I get so much out of putting these discussions together for you. And I hope they're also edifying to all of you. And to all of you who are saying thank you, I say a, a sincere and heartfelt, you're welcome. Violinist, would you like to close us with a piece or two on the violin, please?